Welcome everyone. I'll call tonight's regular council meeting to order. Recommendation that the regular council meeting be suspended and the committee of the whole meeting be convened. Moved by Councilor Renhawa, second by Councilor Morrow. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Before we get started, I just uh, I'm guessing there's a few people here about the Van Arsdal uh, variants. Is that correct? Yes. So what I would uh, do then is I'd recommend that uh, we adopt the committee the whole uh, meeting agenda with an additional item uh, for Van Arsdal uh, uh, folks who want to speak to that. On I'll, I would move that to item C and then push uh, committee the whole meeting uh, discussion to D. Is that okay? So I'd move that. Second by Councillor uh, Cunningham. All those in favor? Yeah. Motion's carried. Okay, so we'll get started. We have uh, three uh, pieces of uh, on our agenda tonight for the Committee of the Whole. And uh, before we get started, I just going to quickly read a statement from the Chair. Uh, so for those of you present this evening and for those watching by television, please let me explain that the Committee of the Whole meeting is a committee that consists of all members of Council. This meeting allows council members to deal with issues in greater detail, but is less formal than a regular council meeting. During this meeting, issues are not formally adopted, but recommendations may be made at the next regular council meeting. At, the, at that time, the recommendations of the previous committee of the whole meeting will be adopted and acted upon. Some key points to remember when making your presentations are, remember council meetings are televised and it is very important to introduce yourself and if applicable, name of the organization that you're representing and speak directly into the microphone in a clear voice. When presenting, please address any comments or uh, questions to the chair. Uh, keep your presentation brief, uh, three to five minutes max, uh, as council has several presentations on the agenda. Uh, once you have completed your presentation, please ensure you summarize any requests or concerns. Uh, the chair will then ask council members if they have any questions. Remember, there are no decisions made at this meeting on any requests or concerns you have made. And lastly, requests will be referred to staff for review, report, and recommendation to council. And so, with that being said, uh, we'll start off um, with the North Coast Immigration and Multi uh, Multicultural Services Society uh, regarding the uh, Truth uh, and Reconciliation Commission Calls to Action update. So if you'd like to come forward uh, to speak to Council, I believe I've seen a couple of their members here tonight, Ladan and... Uh, oh, Peggy, okay. Oh, we have different names and on the agenda as well. Welcome. Stavenport, how are you doing? Good. You can press the green button on that mic there, and I will get you guys up online with us. Welcome. Oh, we aren't going anywhere. <laughs> Before you get started, Ms. Sanchez, could you press the green button on that microphone there? And then you can bring that forward to you a little bit closer to you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, having a chance to come and make our presentation to you. We are here on behalf of the North Coast Community Response Network, which we call the CRN. CRN is under the umbrella of North Coast Immigrant and Multicultural Society. Um, representatives here is myself, Louisa Sanchez, and Peggy Davenport, and Colleen Hermanson. The objective of our terms of reference to you when this project started was that we would like to encourage, promote, and document the effects of various agencies in Prince Rupert to fulfill the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, the TRC as we call it, calls to action rec recommendations and that the results are formally presented to Council. More than half of the population of Prince Rupert the First Nations, and we are all connected genetically through family and in friendships. We have been affected by the harms created by the residential school experience to some extent. The areas we described in our report to you 
are welfare, child welfare, education, health care by Michael Melia of Northern Health, the Aboriginal Justice Program, the museum, archives, and library, and newcomers to Canada by the North Coast Immigrant and Multicultural Services Society and commemoration. In our cover letter sent to you, we briefly described some of the history which led up to the decision of the Can Canadian federal government at the time to make residential schools mandatory and to kill the Indian in the child. We gave a brief in introduction to some of our, our report and followed this by an appeal to you to advocate for the Prince Rupert community regarding three areas of concern. Services such as options for sexual and reproductive health are offered on a schedule and drop-in basis. The importance of drop-in cannot be underestimated, understated, I'm sorry, for our community. Prince Rupert is a port city with a large expanding terminal and a major coast rail service. Our community is struggling with the associated problems of an underground movement of drugs, alcohol, smuggling, and prostitution. The need for services to be responsive, preventive, and drop-ins is very important health care and otherwise. Ensuring we include residents from Acropolis Manor and remembering Acropolis Manor is the home for many of our seniors is important. Finding the ways to include residents in the community events and bringing the community to Acropolis is important and contributes to quality of life and sense of community. And finally, upon commemor commemoration, we draw your attention to the totem poles here in front of the City Hall. These are replicas of old Haida totem poles. We point out that the totem pole that was carved by Bill Helene in honor of his deceased father, Art Helene, is a current relevant Shimshon totem pole. The word crest is on, on it because Art Helene played in the crest basketball team for years when he was a young man. Prince Rupert community of indigenous and non-indigenous artists is strong and capable, and we need their help to correct this. So what we have to you, we have a report to the Prince Rupert Mayor and Council, and I'm hoping that you read it. And we also include the cover letter and the oral presentation to TRC report to the City of um, Prince Rupert Mayor and Council. Did you want to add anything? Just wondered if there was any, if there are any questions. Councilor Renaud. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for your presentation. And I can tell I attended many meetings with them, and they work really hard. And uh, it's a great report and document for our community. Thank you. Oh, I uh, have to hit that green button again. All of the descriptions of the services in town that we have included doesn't include everything by all means. And what we did was look at what was consistent with the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, the 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 wording of all of the descriptions, uh, if they were written by anyone else, they were certainly approved of and added to by the the people who were in charge of those services. So they're not our words; they belong to them. Um, uh, I think I think that what we we need to appreciate is that, first of all, there have been 41 countries in the world who have um, used uh, rec truth uh, commissions or truth and reconciliation commissions uh, because of government 
decisions which have caused uh, so much suffering and pain for people in their countries. These include Vietnam and, so and South Africa. So Canada is one of 41. We are not the only ones doing this. And it was because of a government decision uh, to make the residential schools mandatory and that the and that the intent of the government was to kill the Indian in the child quote uh, as a result the children who went to the residential school some of them came back with happy memories many of them were brutally um, brutally abused um, but they lost contact with their culture they lost the opportunity to um, to experience good parenting, so they didn't develop parenting skills easily. They uh, returned to their communities unable to speak the language of the community, and so they were they were estranged from their from their families, and. Um, and they lost the connection to their spiritual approach. Uh, it was uh, cultural. It was cultural genocide, and everyone seems to to agree that that was true. So we're not saying that just because um, First Nations Indigenous peoples were abused, many people around the world who have been abused. We're not saying it's because they suffered. Many people have, have suffered. This commission is about a government decision to do what they did. And so it's a government responsibility. Um, um, the the um, uh, Family and Children Services worked very hard to keep the children, the families, connected. They, we have found uh, through recent research at UBC that the, uh, the First Nations communities in British Columbia uh, that, were, that were investigated through the Department of Psychiatry by some psychologists that the First Nations communities who were teaching their young people about their culture and were involved in their own history and culture did not have a problem with suicide. It was the, the children of the communities that felt disconnected. Doesn't mean that people are not modern. Doesn't mean that they're not forward-looking doesn't mean they don't use the internet and have advanced education and abilities and they're leaders now, but it does mean that it's important for us to know our history in order to have the strength to move forward. And then the, the other areas that we covered were very important. Um, you'll see we were really impressed by how, how, how hard people work. Thank you. And last but not least, um, we wanted to talk about the business and reconciliation. I know you're running out of time, but NICMAS, and that's North Coast Immigrant and Multicultural Services, has sent a letter of support and suggestion to make June 21st a National Aboriginal Statutory Holiday. The letters are being gathered by Carlene Lindsay at Northwest Community College and will be sent off to Georgina Jollyboy, who is a member of Parliament. She's act actively taking this on, and we can sign a petition on her website. The beginning of the letter states that the roots of what we are and continue to be as a country is Aboriginal. The roots of our culture and heritage are the unique qualities of cultural diversity, inclusiveness, respect for one another, and consultation instead of confrontation leading to violence. These are the reasons the newcomers of the Canadian landscape survived and flourished over 250 years ago. 
Toward the end, the letter goes on to state that by recognizing National Aboriginal Day as a statutory holiday, business owners and employees, as well as the rest of us, will be able to celebrate, explore, and revel in the Aboriginal cultures of our great country. I want to thank you for giving us the time to do this. And um, we, if anybody would like a copy of the 94 recommendations, we could not do them all, but we specifically dealt with the ones that we felt that were pertinent to Prince Rupert. Thank you for your time. And, and then just to add that I'm going to circulate around a photograph of the description of the two totem poles in front of City Hall which are, you know, so outdated and, and uh, dumb. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you for your guys' hard work here. I know we've been working, members of council, we've been working with you guys individually on other initiatives as well. So the work you're doing here is great. Um, we're going to review uh, the things you've written as well as the recommendations that you've outlined, letter support, things like that, and we'll bring those up at a future council meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor, uh, we have one question here from Councillor. I, I just couldn't find a list of, did you have a list of recommendations that you want, what you wanted Council specifically to do other than, than um, um, other than change the, uh, or do something with the, with the totem poles out front because you're saying that they're Haida poles, not some sand poles. But uh, do you have any other recommendations? I saw one about the National Aboriginal Day, but it wasn't a recommendation to council. Did you have a list of recommendations that I'm missing? or? Um, oh, sorry. Um, the, um, uh, it's just for us to be aware. I'm sure that there are people who are working on, you know, their, their art projects and I believe that Joanne Finley may have some some ideas with some people that she works with. But we need to encourage that kind of thinking. The Shimshian communities are extremely active and progressive and do all kinds of things. And what do we do with Haida totem poles? It's pretty un... un you know, it's dumb. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, oh, 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 just real quick, real quick. <laughs> uh, the, uh, as far as Northern Health goes, uh, we cannot make any decisions for Northern Health. All we can do is advocate for the people in Prince Rupert. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for all your hard work. Okay. Next up, we have Kathleen Palm and Evelyn Basso regarding the CBC Radio 1 update. I believe. Are they Kathleen here and Evelyn? Perhaps it was just meant as a written... A written... Okay, well, I don't see them here today, so we will take the information. Did they submit a written? Because we've been working with them before on this, so yeah, right here. Yeah. Okay, so just for information purposes here. Maybe, Your Worship, we can ask them to come and address us at in, the, yeah. the, in the next month sure. because I think that would be good yeah, we'll to hear Kathleen and I assume they were going to be here tonight, so uh, maybe it was just some uh, miscommunication there. Okay, so we'll uh, schedule them for the next uh, next council meeting then to come speak to it. Uh, so moving on then, uh, so we have about 18 letters from uh, folks about the Van Arsdale uh, variants. So, and I know that there's folks here in the audience that'd like to speak to it. I'm not sure if we need absolutely everybody to come speak to it. So if there's a few of you that'd like to come together to talk about the Van Arsdale variants, uh, you can feel free. You can come one at a time. I'm not discouraging that. Just for the sake of time, uh, we have read your guys' letters, uh, definitely understand the concerns, so if someone wants to come and uh, maybe summarize for the whole group, or you guys can all come one by one, that's uh, up to you. However, uh, feel free to come speak about the, the variants. Welcome, Miss Warren.
Absolutely. I'm Judy Warren. I live at 2121 Graham. I have lived on Graham Avenue for 47 years. I was appointed to the Heritage Advisory Committee by Mayor Pete Lester and served for over 30 years on that committee. I was one of the many citizens that produced the Quality of Life Community Plan. We worked many months with the hired expert to produce a good OCC that represented all of the citizens of Prince Rupert. We elected Mayor and Council to represent us, the people of Prince Rupert. Mayor Brain, you have said the city will also go back to the original Bretton Hall plan. We were a planned city and that plan is still excellent today. We have good sound bylaws and zoning and qualified staff that our taxpayer dollars pay for. Our area has eight people over 90 years, close to 40 over 70 years, and the rest are young working families that volunteer or are involved with sports, dance, etc., which helps make our city a great place to live. We are all tired of every few months having to write letters and come to council to say no to speculators who wish not to abide by the OCC bylaws and zoning. The castle is the second most significant heritage home in the city of Prince Rupert and deserves protection. The subdivision of this lot does not meet any bylaws or zones, zoning rules. So say no and give the planning department authorization to reject this kind of proposal without neighborhoods having to fight to have the rules upheld. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Warren. Other speakers I'd like to come speak about Van Arsel? Council will make their comments in the regular meeting uh, when the meet when we adjourn committee the whole. Um, however, we would like to hear from you. Is there anyone else that would like to come speak about the, the variance? Mr. Roberts? Oh, it's already on there. Thank you for uh this opportunity. Uh, I did not intend to speak tonight, but as you all have my comments in the correspondence sent to you recently, along with the correspondence of many other proponents or those in opposition to the granting of the variance, I only want to re reassert how strongly we feel about the neighborhood we live in and have lived in our family in particular for 50 years in, in Section 2, or what used to be Section 2. And uh, I, I see no reason to go against what is an existing bylaw and grant a variance for a long-established property in a well-established neighborhood. And I'd just like to ask you to consider it seriously before granting such a variance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Next. We'll call another time. And a final time regarding Van Arsdal. Okay, so we'll move on to the next agenda item. However, I welcome you to stay to hear the council's discussion at the regular meeting regarding this proposal. Uh, next, we have a discussion around the committee of the whole meetings. So, Mr. Cunningham, why don't you lead us off? Well, this is a prime example of why we need the committee of the whole meetings. The community gets to express what their concerns are about a specific variance or a specific incident, and I see no reason why this was not on the agenda but a lot of the community came out to speak about it and I think it's very important that we listen to the community and that's why I think the Committee of the Whole is a very important part of our meetings once a month. I, uh, I honestly think that we should put some content ourselves into it but uh, even in a formal setting like this when people feel strongly about something they're more than willing to come and talk about it and I think it's very very important that we keep this going and then from there uh, Blair has some ideas about some informal meetings which I think we can actually add but I think the committee of the whole, the cow as we call it 
is very important to this town. It's been here forever, and I don't think we should even cancel if there's nothing on the agenda. We can go through the motion, ask three times. If no one comes up to speak, we get on with our regular business. But giving the town the opportunity to come forth to council when they can't normally is very, very important. Yeah, and I'll, I definitely agree with that. I think tonight's exactly the per, ex, prime example of the use of it. I think uh, we have it for the reason to discuss business items particularly. I think the issue was it was being branded as a public engagement tool, but I don't see it as an engagement tool as it is an opportunity for, for people to come make presentations, speak to specific issues at our council business, and then having other opportunities to have other public engagement opportunities outside of this area, like through redesign, some meaningful engagement where we had almost 2,000 residents give us feedback. We're not going to have 2,000 people show up to Committee Hall and show, tell us what they think about the community. So a mix of public engagement into the community as well as having these uh, these sessions. And you're correct in saying that uh, you know there are issues that arise where folks don't think to schedule um, it onto the Committee Hall. So yeah, I agree. We should just keep it going the way it is, and I see it as a valuable tool. Okay, Councillor Merle? I, I definitely with you, agree with you guys in terms of tonight being a prime example of, of the use of Committee of the Whole. The, the one, um, I think kind of the the spirit of what Councillor Cunningham and I were going at in terms of what, what could we do to make Committee of the Whole more valuable is those, those instances where there's nothing on the agenda, unlike tonight where there's no one on the agenda, there's nothing scheduled to be presented, and there's nothing that's particularly contentious and no one shows up, how can we add value to the exercise of Committee of the Whole in, in some of those instances? And that's that's kind of what I think we need some more discussion on, is how can we add value to something that we're already going to be doing on a regular basis when there's no business on the agenda? Right. Having departments report... <laughs> Once a month. <laughs> I'll flog a dead horse again, but it's a prime example of getting it out to the public. This this meeting is covered by the press, television, and watched by people on TV. But uh, I, I really think that uh, if we have different departments come and just let people know what's going on. You know, like Veronica sets it on, puts it on on the website, but a lot of people don't use computers or don't go to the website. You know, 20 years from now, everyone will. <laughs> but right now, we're in this transition stage where some of us just like an old-fashioned newspaper or go down to Tim Hortons and find out what the latest rumor is. But, uh, you know, it's, it's important that we get that out to the public, and uh, it's something I've been asking for for a while, and I know it's slowly starting to happen, but the sooner the better. It's, it's all about transparency. You know, like, if we don't talk about something, people think we're hiding something. So I really think that just by having an open meeting and talking about things, people say, oh, well, they're not really hiding anything. There's no secret society in City Hall. What are you talking about? It's MI6 back here. <laughs> Councilor Kinney. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I think it's great because uh, if anybody in the city is interested in what's going on, it's certainly Graham Avenue because they've always expressed their interest, they've done their homework, and they come forward and speak to us, and it makes sense, and I think it's great, and I'd like to thank you all for coming. Any comments about the Camille? <coughs> probably as old as most of the Graham Avenue people and I remember a time when when um, when I used to come to council when I was um, uh, before I was a councillor to bring things that were important we addressed um, we addressed things that are important to the fishing industry we addressed things that were important to labor I've been in front of this council many a time uh, with, with Jeannie Hartney and I, if Evelyn Basso was here, she'd probably have a good laugh. But but she was counselor when we used to come to council and talk about um, about uh, the danger of nuclear bombs and the danger of 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 trying to uh, of allowing American subs into our harbor. 
with nuclear capabilities and uh, because they were coming into our harbor in those days and 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 all kinds of issues to bring up to city council that aren't going to be agenda items because council they weren't agenda items for the council of the day but they were agenda items for those people in the community we had huge peace marches in 1980, 1981, 1982, in this community. Um, and those things were not coming from council, but they were brought by the community to council. So, so you know, I think it, the fact that people feel that they can come and have a, they have a place and a time and they don't have to demonstrate outside the building to come and talk to us is important. And it seems to me that you have to have a time on the agenda where to do that. If there are no burning issues, well, good. But if there are burning issues and somebody wants to talk about the peace movement, which is something that um, uh, is something I think we should be discussing uh, these days of, of increased um, 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 nuclear danger, um, you know, that, that if somebody wanted to come and talk to us, that there would be a time and a place for them to come and not just have to demonstrate outside or try to find a place in the regular agenda. The, the, also in, in the, um, um, when Pete Lester was mayor, which was probably before you were born, when you were speaking earlier about <laughs> not having been around on council, this is probably, th there used to be, um, um, the fire chief used to be here, the public, um, uh, I, I don't even know what their titles were, the person in charge of public works, I think the RCMP many times sat in, but there were senior staff, sitting departmental staff, who would sit at the table, and then if a council wanted to ask a question about, is that true, you know, was that pothole really filled or wasn't it filled, uh, and, I, and I think what happened is over the years that the, that the um, chief, um, chief administrator, Administrator, so would would out, would get a list of those questions and find answers for us as as being more cost effective than paying staff to be at council meetings. So you know, I'm I'm always interested to hear if there's a particular project going on, or or certainly the um, the please give us a report. I think it's called the mayor's report. Um, I think it's quarterly. And uh, certainly it would be good to, you know, have the RCMP come and present that their report. It talks about the statistics. It talks about, you know, that then then we can ask them questions. But that's not necessarily it. We could do that on a regular meeting because we don't involve the public in those right. questions, right? We're not asking the public to come up and ask the RCMP, you know, why they stopped them on 4th Avenue in the middle of the night for driving the wrong direction when they weren't really under the influence. So, so I mean, th those kinds of questions, we don't, we don't, we've never encouraged the public to ask those questions, but we certainly want the public to come, be able to come here and, and make presentations and make us aware of something today. So at Mrs. Sanchez and, and, um, you know, th th you know, it's an excellent written report. It was a, it was a good short presentation. Makes, it brings you to look at some of the other sections of the report that you may not have have studied as well instead of just giving you a written report and expecting you to to um, read it and maybe miss some of the more important sections of it. So, so I think that uh, cows are something that should not be done away with, and I and I think that this is one of the ways that we can hear from the public about issues that are important to them, and uh, and and have have a time where we can ask questions if we don't quite understand. Um, um, 100% the presentation, or if we think there's a point that w that we would like to make, so I, I think that's that's a good thing. Other comments from council? Okay, at this time, if there's any other members of the public that like to come speak to council about any topic, they can come forward now. Okay, seeing none, uh, I'd like to take a motion to adjourn and re re reconvene our regular council meeting. Moved by Councillor Cunningham, second by Councillor Nish. All those in favour? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you for your comments tonight. Okay, item two, recommendation that the agenda for the regular council meeting of October 30th, 2017 be adopted as presented.
Moved by Councilor Anish, second by Councilor Cunningham. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Item 3A, recommendation that the minutes of the special council meeting of October 16, 2017 be adopted. Moved by Councilor Ranhawa, seconded by Councilor Moreau. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Item 3B, recommendation that the minutes of the regular council meeting of October 16, 2017 be adopted. Moved by Councilor Cunningham, second by Councilor Anish. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Okay, first up we have a uh, delegation, Mr. Dale Gunn from the District Manager of the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure um, of the Skeena District uh, regarding the shift into winter. Welcome. And uh, do you have a presentation on there as well? Okay, perfect. And before you get started, I just want to say that this is the man that's responsible for helping us get our downtown paved. Oh. And so we want to say thank you very much for that because we partnered with the provinces who Mr. Pucci was interfacing with to make sure we could get Third Avenue as part of the contract, saved us a whole pile of money, taxpayer money. Uh, so this is the face to the person that helped us get that done. So thank you very much for that. Thanks. Happy to help. And uh, uh, my team was uh, more more responsible than me. They uh, really uh, made it work working with Richard, and uh, and uh, they really worked well together. So appreciate yes. that, though. Very Absolutely, much. I'll pass it on. Is it? Uh, I think uh, where would be the uh, so maybe yeah. that would. Did we load it up there, Mr. Mandrick? His presentation. Um, Do I click on or? I'm not sure which one would be your presentation there. Um. Hey, we'll take a look. This one? Not, it's also not crucial for it. Like okay. I can just well, go without we it. apologize about that. <laughs> no Technical problem. difficulties. Put a lot of effort into it. No. Did <laughs> you? No. Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> it's okay. We all like doing work twice, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Do you have it on an email or anything like that, or a jump drive? Uh, I, I, in my truck, okay. I have it on a on yeah. a jump drive. Well, let's uh, we'll have a conversation. Though. Oh, Thanks. that that's right on. And oh. All right, so thank you very much for, for having me. For uh, those of you who don't know me, my name is Daryl Gunn, uh, district, uh, as, uh, as uh, Mayor Brain just uh, mentioned, I'm the district manager with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure for the Skeena District. I'm based out of Terrace, but uh, responsible for the whole area, including just east of Terrace, down to Kitimat, the Nass Valley, out here in uh, Prince Rupert, of course, Haida Gwaii, and the Outer Islands all the way down to Clem too. So it's, uh, it's a big area, and I have a, have a real great team that works with me to to be responsible for all things highways, uh, highways related, uh, except for ferries. And uh, so, but what I'm here to talk to you about uh, today is some, uh, another hat I do wear with the uh, Ministry of Transportation. I'm the uh, uh, provincial uh, uh, representative on the uh, Safe Winter Driving uh, Council for BC. And uh, one thing that is our um, our uh, our biggest achievement is uh, is the shift into winter campaign, and I'm just wondering before I get started, who here has uh, heard of the shift shift into winter tagline? A few people. Okay, excellent. So what I wanted to do today was just just briefly uh, describe that because it's something that uh, over the last two years we've invested heavily in uh, advertising in the northwest here. Um, the shift in winter campaign um, or the Safe Winter Driving uh, Alliance uh, started back in 2006. And it was uh, it came after the realization that uh, we've been um, there's a lot of factors that go into safe winter driving. A part of it that uh, me and my operations team uh, uh, are play a big role in is uh, is winter maintenance, just like uh, your crews for the city crews. But another thing that we thought that was lacking out there in the in the public sphere was uh, driver education. And um, and what we set it about was to uh, to try and change the uh, the social norms around uh, safe winter driving conditions, specifically uh, driving to the conditions. And um, so that started with the advertising campaign um, back in 2006, focused on 
the high population centers with uh, uh, winter uh, winter conditions. Uh, so that was Kelowna, Kamloops, and Prince George. And we've slowly uh, expanded across the province just based off of really good results. And happy to say that in the Northwest last year, we started uh, investing in uh, radio advertisements, uh, paper advertisements, uh, bus ads, uh, doing community events, and all focused on um, on preparing yourself, preparing your vehicle, and preparing for trips you make uh, in the winter. Um, and what drove all this was when we crunched the statistics with uh, RCMP and ICBC, uh, both uh, partners as part of the sh uh, Safe Winter Driving uh, Committee, uh, the the number of uh, fatal accidents or injury-related accidents uh, due to driving to uh, uh, not driving to conditions doubles from October to December, and uh, and that's a number that we really see that there's a lot of opportunity that drivers can take into their own hands. Most of them are uh, single vehicle accidents. Uh, and the worst ones are the ones that involve multiple accidents. And usually it can uh, mostly be avoided by preparing your vehicle, winter tra tires, um, and then also changing your driving behavior. And, um, and that's what the, the campaign is, uh, is all about. So um, I had a few other things that uh, I had on my presentation. Let me just look to see if they're uh, there. Um, I'm really happy to, uh, to say that uh, in the Northwest, uh, due to, uh, every year we do a uh, extensive survey that uh, is a phone survey, and, uh, and uh, last year was the first one after uh, advertising in the Northwest, and happy to say that the, the, uh, the message upkeep or uptake has been uh, ex uh, exceptionally well in the Northwest, so we are getting through to everybody, so, um, and we know that uh, with the community leaders, uh, and especially through the municipalities that uh, anybody who can help spread that message um, can really help get through to, to all the different drivers out there. Um, we're looking through for different opportunities to, to get out there. I did bring some, uh, some pamphlets that I was hoping that, to, that um, could put, put in the uh, into City Hall here. And then our biggest tool for spreading the word is also shiftintowinter.ca. Also brought some ice scrapers that has that, has that on there. These are good for having in your vehicle. I know in Rupert when you have the, the moisture in there and it freezes, you get the frozen on the inside, so these are pretty handy to have, have inside. And there's a lot of promotional campaigns on there, uh, posters that can be printed out, put in public places, um, and our, um, you'll see it on there. It really shows uh, just uh, um, drives home the message, these posters, about how uh, conditions change and so should your speed. Um, because one of the biggest things we see, and with again talking with the RCMP, who are uh, provincial members of this, is uh, the worst accidents that we see out on the highways are not during the bad storms, or not when it's really obvious. It's when you start to see a little bit of asphalt, and you and, a, and the storm subsides, and people start to pick up their speed, and they're driving as fast as they do in the summertime. So we're really trying to drive that message. That's what our campaign is focused on this year. So again, any support and being able to get those uh, posters, I can even get them printed out and sent here into Great. whether it's uh, the arena or, or sure. the swimming pool and stuff like that. Um, but again, just wanted to spread that message and see if, um, make sure you knew what was going on. Great, thank you. Is there some questions from Councillor Councillor Renhal? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> thanks for your present presentation and uh, thanks for doing all the great work for our communities. Is there any programs for the colleges or for the school kids to educate them against for the winter driving? Uh, like I know MAD, Mother Against Drunk Drivers and RCMP, ICBC doing great jobs. So is there any programs for the schools, special or colleges, young kids? and for the employers so they can educate their uh, employees. Is there any program for going on? Um. Uh, as for programs, that's that's not something that we've uh, we've got in uh, we've uh, start uh, tackled yet. We've really focused on the advertising. Um, one thing we have developed, and it's on the shiftintowinter.ca website, and it's um, another big um, sorry funding member of the Safe Winter Driving Alliance is Work Safe BC, and uh, there's a whole uh, section dedicated to employers. And they even have a uh, a whole course online course that's for free to take of how to set up a uh, safe winter driving uh, program for your company because a lot of these people that drive for work um, it's one of the biggest a lot of people don't realize it's the biggest uh, work uh, hazard for many many uh, industries out there is is just driving to and from work or driving for work so uh, there is that bit of education piece. Um, but getting out to, uh, I think, high schools and, and colleges, I think, is a next step that we want to take. 
um, we uh, again, but certainly certainly recognize that and think it's a very good idea and something we'll we'll be looking to do. Other council members, Councillor Cunningham, the niche. Uh, two questions. First one, while we've got you here in the hot seat, is when's the overpass for the railway crossing on? <laughs> going to be the time frame for that and the other one is what's the designation our highway now has for winter for clearing and that so in, in regards to the, uh, the the mile 28 overpass so we are still uh, committed as a ministry to, to doing that project uh, we had some some issues with the the tender language which we uh, unfortunately had to, had to cancel that um, and then again with the uh, with the election and and the change in government, there there still was a was a review. I'm I'm uh, happy to say that as far as what I know, we're still committed to, to doing that, and we are just working on revising the the language that uh, that we needed to address. We needed to make some changes to uh, um, on a technical as uh, aspect, uh, a retaining wall, and then also some some. Uh, uh, First Nations uh, incentive language, uh, which was a mistake made by us that we we caught with their contracts people. So now that we've been given the green light, we're working on rectifying that. Um, I would say early 2019 uh, uh, would be to get that out to tender. But again, uh, that all depends on uh, on on how it comes together. But uh, that that's the current uh, schedule. But um, uh, I would say that is an optimistic timeline. But that's what the plan is. So happy to say that we are still committed to it and, and working to get that out. Um, the other thing for the uh, classification, uh, it is a, a Highway 16 is a Class A highway, so that's a Class A winter maintenance. So it's the uh, same as the Trans Canada, same as Highway 16 through Prince George, same as um, as all those all those uh, top ones. Um, and that change was made about uh, four years ago. Thank you, Councilor Nish. I was going to ask the same question about the overpass, but um, thank you for your presentation, and you already answered the question. Councillor Kinney? Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you know or not, but uh, do you have any idea or anything been said when we are going to have cell coverage all the way to Terrace? Some of us are seniors, and, you know, we need help once in a while, and there's nowhere, you know, certain spots you can't even get nothing. Unfortunately, I don't know the the answer to that. I know there has been some uh, some really good work uh, to to improve uh, spots, um, but that hasn't uh, hasn't filled in all the gaps. Definitely um, by by any means. I'm I'm you know I stop at the rest areas to, to check the emails on the on the way in and out. But uh, it's something that I, I'd like to see. But unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. Other questions from council? Okay, just want to say thank you, and also that I just wanted to make you aware that uh, we actually have a resident in the audience tonight, Mr. Brian Denton, who actually wrote a book recently, just published, about highway safety and things like that in BC, and you may be interested in connecting with him sometime to, to talk about his book, because he does w raise awareness for a variety of issues, so I thought I'd give you a quick plug there, Mr. Denton, because I know you're passionate about highway safety, and we have Mr. from Transportation here, so I thought I'd connect that, but I just want to say thank you very much for your uh, presentation, and uh, We'll help you with the awareness, and we'll also make sure to get something on social media uh, to help with you guys' campaign. Excellent. Um, can I just leave this with... Absolutely. You can leave it uh, right over there. And Can I just say one more Absolutely. thing? Just for, for Councillor Kenny, I, I will uh, just look into if I have anybody in the uh, ministry that has that answer, and I'll just uh, connect with, with somebody to get the Thank message you. to you. Not, I don't know if I'll be able to find it, but I'll, I'll try. Thank you. I believe that answer is through uh, Ms. Sims' ministry. I can't remember this innovation ministry or a citizenship or, or what was her what's her ministry? I'm not oh, sure. Technology, anyways. Yeah. And I remember her mentioning something about wanting to do connectivity up in the northwest here. Okay, I'll so. I'll look into it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have a great evening. Okay, moving on. Uh, we have a presentation from our community planner. Application for development variance permit at 535 Hayes Cro Cove Circle. Oh, Mr. Krekic, welcome. Caroline Winchelling, community planner, is not well today, so oh. I'll be sitting in her place, and you have to contend with this ugly mug a bit longer than usual. <coughs> I checked mine. <coughs> So, 
So on October uh, 12, 2017, we received an application for development variance permit for the property located at 535 Hayes Cove Circle uh, for the purpose of, of renovating single-family residents that currently exist in a non-conformance. So if you're looking on the screen, uh, the solid line is the current residence, which is already in non-conformance, and it's 0.5 meters from the side property line where it's necessary to have 1.2 meters. The objective of this renovation is to raise this house 1.1 meters that would essentially take the house out of the hole and kind of place it a little bit closer to the um, to the street elevation and therefore improve the um, drainage as well as the overall uh, aspect of the house. Um, the um, the um, variant is for the piece of the uh, building which is going to rise on both sides and therefore further encroach on this side onto property line. Uh, the increase to dwelling and the setback in infringement will be insufficient to be deemed to adversely affect the neighborhood residents which are currently sitting on the same grade as the street. The applicant requires approval to proceed to public notification. You move in it? Okay, so uh, moved by Councillor Nish that the development variance permit application number DP1712 for 535 Hayes Cove Circle proceed to public notification. Seconded by Councillor Cunningham. Discussion? Councillor Cunningham? Actually, nothing's really changing here. He's just lifting the house up. Yeah. So that you know, so th these are the type of variances I like to see in pass because it's improving the neighborhood and it's improving the the, the quality of the lot in the house. It's uh, this is this is a win-win. There are times when uh, we have conversations. You know, do we want to bug the council with um, with certain of these that may be considered trivial? However. Um, you know, rules are rules, and um, in this situation, uh, this uh, this variance will improve the, uh, the the quality of life of this household and definitely that part of the neighborhood. Mr. Krekic, just for the folks that are here tonight, what's the process in terms of the public notification, like in terms of time, how long, and the radius of who you send things to, just because we'll be discussing that in a moment anyway, so this ought to be good for just a bit of an information share. So our process in development variance permit is that uh, we allow two weeks for public notification, meaning that immediately after Monday night's meeting, the next day we hand deliver notification that advises the neighbors who are within 50 meters of the um, of the uh, property. Um, everybody has that doesn't preclude somebody who is not in, in within that circle to to submit their comments um, and um, I prepare or we prepare our reports uh, basically one week in advance so by Tuesday Wednesday morning our reports are done and um, those comments that were received by that time are included in a report uh, and those comments that are received afterwards are distributed to the council prior to this meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Item B. Uh, so we have, uh, yeah, so Van Aerstal. This application is um, was looked at the council at the last meeting and it is for variance at 160 Van Arsdal. At the last meeting, uh, there were some questions, um, and so I have included some additional slides in my presentation to, to uh, try to address those questions that were, ra that was, that were raised last time, <coughs> and that we don't have any confusion. Uh, the highlighted area, which is greenish, yellowish, is the current lot. Uh, the bluish outline is the um, existing building uh, ref reference to, reference to as castle. 
The proposed subdivision is along uh, the red dashed line which would produce two lots, both of which would be larger than minimum size lot required for R2 zone. The variance or the infraction which would be part and parcel of this variance is the floor area ratio which would on this size of the lot raise from 1.0 to 1.2 floor area ratio. So that's essentially the, the, the purpose of this variance. The applicant has received a preliminary letter of approval for subdivision and subject to receiving the variance will proceed to final subdivision. Public notification were hand delivered October 17 and as of the date of this report staff received two general inquiries seeking additional information. Since then, most of it actually in today, we received 18 uh, comments, which were all um, copied and distributed to the council prior to this meeting. Um, arguably, most of the comments are in relation to other matters than purpose of this development variance permit. After reviewing the comments, council can proceed to final consideration. That concludes my report, and I can answer any questions. Sure. Council Cunningham, or Council Nish, then Council Cunningham. Like I said at the last meeting, uh, where I have a problem with this is, is making uh, a current building uh, go over the the area that is is proposed. I can understand, you know, it's kind of a unique property that it's got road access from both sides. Um, if there was no building on that lot and you could divide it into two lots, like any other lot in this town, um, then, you know, I could see it making more sense. But by turning that particular house and make it non-conforming, that is where my problem is with this development. Because I do not believe that we should be setting the precedent of making non-conforming properties all over this town because otherwise everyone will want to do that uh, in order to to split up the properties. Um, and on a personal, I, I can't believe they would even think about destroying that beautiful house, but uh, that's not really why we're here. So that's my uh, opinion on it. Thank you. Councillor Cunningham? Well, last council meeting when we put this out to public, we made a comment then that lets the people in the area decide and I think they decided for us a resounding no. Uh, while I was looking at this I came across a couple of other things. Right now the castle is being used as either a bed and breakfast or a boarding house because it's on uh, Airbnb as a rental property and they don't have a business license for that. I have no problem with that house. I don't live there, the neighbors do, they might, but I have no problem with that house being showcased as a bed and breakfast or something if it's done properly. But I'm totally against the variance, but if that house is not be following the bylaws that are in place already, I have a problem with that also. And that's something I've asked the department to look into. But I'm definitely against this. Councillor Thokson. Uh, I have one question and uh, and then a request and a request. My, my request is uh, if you could explain the process of subdivision and why the subdivision is not before council. It's just the uh, uh, nonconformity that's before council. And uh, my that so that's my request. My question is. What does the OCP say um, about this area of town? Doesn't the OCP say that this area of town is supposed to have larger lots? And, and, and I was wondering, Mr. Craig, if, we, if you could just run through that for me. Uh, Your microphone. Uh, Mr. Craig. Thank you. So... Um, Subdivision is a process which is uh, which rests with uh, municipality, and municipality uh, selects an individual who inherits the responsibility of subdivision. Subdivision approving officer uh, is um, um, 
independent party within a, within uh, the organization um, and um, has to take in account all of the um, um, benefits and detriments of that subdivision. Um, subdivision officer can hold a public hearing, um, but that's not often uh, practiced. Subdivision approving officer will, upon receiving an application, um, refer it to all of the appropriate or he would refer it to all of the departments within a city um, which also may include the uh, Ministry of Highways to seek their input. In this situation uh, the only thing that came out that was a um, uh, um, um, uh, contentious is uh, this infraction of the zoning bylaw to which end uh, the subdivision is subject to um, receiving a development variance permit. Was that uh, sort of what you were looking for, Councilor Torkson? Yeah, just just that that zoning that subdivision doesn't come before a council, and and uh, um, and why doesn't that occur? It is a provincial legislation. It's not it's not the choice of the city. And then, uh, because I think that's a that's a good question. Why would the city even consider subdividing this piece of property? The, 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 and then the second question was just having to do with the character of the neighborhood. I thought we had some language about the character. And then, why, and then if we do, why wasn't that taken into consideration by the subdivision uh, person responsible for subdiv for for making a recommendation in the subdivision? So subdivision approving officer didn't miss anything. Uh, that area is zone R2. Uh, there is nothing in the official community plan that uh, separates that area from any other area in town. There were a couple of letters which referenced to a section in the official community plan to larger lots, but if you read the entire section, uh, that policy was for um, areas that are outside of town and mo Exactly, the points were fi uh, the point. The finger was pointing to area that we call uh, um, the bay on the entrance into the community um, where the ho hospital was, Miller. Miller Bay. That was, and therefore the official community plan. If you look at the land use map, has a yellow, yellow um, uh, hue on on a por portion of that area, noting that this is for future purposes and those larger lots that would be acreages. Councillor Ron Howard and Councillor Morrow. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Uh, there's a lot of concern from the neighborhood about the parking issues and uh, the property used for. So until those questions answered for more education, uh, I'm not in favor of any various development. Councillor Morrow. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I just want to echo exactly what uh, Councillor Nish had said earlier, just uh, in terms of um, my way of thinking about this is um, granting granting this variance for the, the lower lot or the proposed lot, not only does it put the existing structure into uh, nonconformance, but it also puts it into nonconformance by a factor of between 20 to 30 percent when you're looking at the, the floor area ratio. So to me, that that's grounds alone. Um, to, for me to, to speak in opposition to this variance. Yeah, just to uh, be clear to folks that are here as well, <clears throat> Council has a legal obligation to accept any proposal that comes forward, but what we do through the Council process is collect the information that we need to make good decisions for this community, and part of that is sending things like this to public in notification. Um, whether we decide to do that or not is a, at this time, we decide those things. So, uh, Ms. Warren, you made a comment earlier at the community hall that why do we ha bring these things forward? Well, it's not council necessarily bringing things forward as it is developers who bring things forward to us and then we have to follow a process. So, uh, this is just also part of the process. Personally, I'm also not in favor of this either. Um, I believe this is a poor idea and a poor proposal. And I, I echo Mr. Nisha's uh, sentiments about why would you ruin such a beautiful property um, and also add such unnecessary density. Uh, so that's my views at the moment. Uh, so any further discussion about this? So uh, anybody want to move the motion forward then? 
to deny the okay moved by councillor uh, randow seconded by councillor kinney any further discussion okay all those in favor any opposed okay that's a unanimous no You don't have to stay for the rest, but if you would like to, there's other things on our agenda. <laughs> but I'm sure you probably want to go home and finish your dinner. Thank you for coming out tonight. I will uh, just uh, allow a brief moment for the shuffle to occur. Uh, next one on the list, item C, is the application for development variance permit at 1034 First Avenue West. So, <coughs> Microphone, Mr. Crickick, sorry. Yeah. For, those for reminding home. me. Um, and so what happened here? Okay, so this, this development variance permit is for the property located at 1034 First Avenue West is just a few steps away from Five Corners, and um, it is for varying the height. It's for varying the height, and uh, one when we average the four corners, as this as this property is sitting, as you can see here graphically on a bank. When we uh, measure the four corners, the uh, the overall height is increased by approximately seven feet. Um, this property is located within multiple family development permit area, and consequently, this application is associated with development permit application as well. This is a new build in an established neighborhood. The property's bu building will have three residential floors with a garage that would be, under, uh, let's call it an indoor garage. Um, and uh, I've checked into it, um, Council Torkerson, it's, it's, it's able to, con uh, to, to accommodate five, five vehicles. <clears throat> so in essence, it will be an improvement of what was there before, which was an old and dilapidated building. The public notice were handed, hand delivered on October 17th, and as of the date of this report, we received two general inquiries, inquiries seeking more information, one written comment uh, on the record of viewing, which is included with your report, and one written comment included also in attachment four, and since, since then we have not received any, any additional comments. Uh, the council meeting, council asked about storm drainage and the effect of the new building on the, on the neighborhood, which is essentially the questions that were raised by the uh, that were raised by the um, by the comments that are included in the report. Uh, to this, to that end, uh, with respect to storm drainage, the applicant has applied and paid for storm drainage connection, which will be connected by the city works crews in the near future. So the uh, all of the storm drain that was that uh, that that um, uh, Councillor Nish and Councillor Cunningham talked about will be alleviated into the uh, into the sanitary uh, storm sewer connection. With respect to the effect on a neighborhood, including views, the proposed building is essentially of the same mass and size as the dilapidated in a vacant building which sat there previously, and uh, if any views will be missed um, was because the previous building was um, taken down. There are no cost and budget um, impact on the city from getting or not get granting the variance and uh, this application is can proceed to final consideration. 
Yeah, any further comments from Councillor okay, Councillor Thurkelson? I, I, I just want in in this package it says that this building is going to be a, a triplex. Is that correct? It just looks awfully big for a triplex. That's all. It is going to be a, a fairly um, um, yeah. It's going to be the the, the floor the floor the floor uh, area of each unit is quite large and it's going to be a nice building. Uh, how, how many uh, for that zoning? How many um, how many units could there be? So, so on this size of the lot, in uh, in the RM two, um, you can put three point seven units, which uh, we have uh, translated into four units for a couple of uh, in situ densifications that we had in a city, one on a sixth street, and one on. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the street, but uh, on, in the East End. No, no. <laughs> um, Ambrose, 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 and Sixth. So, so um, you know, we have been we have been working with with intensification and trying to find a way how to how to maximize our our infrastructure, um, and so you know, they could have pushed it to four units in a different configuration, perhaps. Perhaps not including the garage, but I think the project that is in front of them suits the developer and definitely suits the neighborhood. I just wondering because I thought I think that it used to be an apartment building that was there and it just looked like more of an apartment building in its design. So that's what what I was asking. And then I see we have a letter uh, from a, a resident who is concerned about the um, um, the, the drainage and. Um, uh, I just again wanted to uh, make sure that there's going to be adequate drainage and and how is this um, um, this resident who seems that he might be impacted uh, uh, by by poor drainage uh, would make sure that that he's not being impacted so so <clears throat> partially. Uh, th this c this point does not does not reflect on development variance permit. Development variance permit is for the height, and so it being one floor, two floors, or three floors, it's always going to be the same area that's going to be drained. However, I have looked into it. I have spoken to the building department. I have spoken to the engineering department. And that part of the development will have to be to the city regulations. In other words, they will not be able to cast water over bank, and they will have to connect to the storm sewer. Okay. Yeah. So, and and you had another question with respect to the effects on the. Um, well, no, that was just the effects of the drain. Uh, I'm not asking if if there are no impacts of drainage. But I just wanted to see because this person seemed to be somewhat doubtful that. So I, I was just wondering what what had been what the city was doing to make sure that er, there was proper drainage. So to make sure, you know, engineering department is it, it is on site to assure that that is done, and building department will not be issuing a building permit until this point is being. Uh, uh, result. Okay. Councillor Nish, then Kenny. Um, I had a look at this property, and and uh, you know, with a if this was on a flat piece of property beside uh, you know properties that were at the same height, then then I would see it, it could be a little bit more you know of a, of a problem. But when I looked at it and I saw you know the house next door it is up on a rock bluff, and realistically this roof line will probably be line up fairly closely to that roof line. Um, I didn't see any signs of uh, blocking any water view for anyone because behind the house is trees. So um, you know I'm I'm all in favor of this one. Councilor Cunningham. The, the only concern was the drainage that I had and it seems to be alleviated but uh, the person that's uh, concerned about the drainage and maybe uh, Richard can uh, elaborate on this he was concerned because evidently the form was started and the drainage was put in around the form before there was a building permit and he doesn't know if it was properly inspected or not and that seems to be his only concern because if you tie something into the storm sewer that hasn't been properly done around the perimeter 
drainage system, then you might have a problem. But I don't see a problem with it, but uh, it's been brought up, and that's the only reason I brought it in. Uh, I think the the person building this has done their due diligence as far as drainage goes and that, but... Uh, you know, it is quite a bank there, and I agree with Councillor Nice on this. It's uh, it's going to be an improvement, and I I too visited the site, and he's right on about the roof line and everything like that. My my only concern at the time was, gee, the underground parking looks awfully small. But how do we rate parking on a, a building like this? Is it per unit or per bedroom? Because each bedroom each unit has four bedrooms. All of our uh, zoning parking requirements are per unit. A single family residential, uh, one one bedroom apartment are basically the same. Councilor Murrow. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I just wanted to repeat what I had said about why I support this from last meeting. I think it achieves a lot of objectives that we're all uh, kind of in agreement about it. It creates more good quality uh, housing that we're all looking to create here in Prince Rupert. It repurposes a dilapidated structure. Uh, it's good infill and revitalization for our for our tax base, and it's also, uh, I think, all of our objectives to increase density of residences in the downtown. So this achieves so many of the objectives that we're all trying to, to work for, so that's why I'm in favor of this motion. Any other comments? Okay, so recommendation of the Develop Variance Permit Application Number DP in 1710 for 1034 for 7 U.S. Proceed to final consideration. Moved by Councillor Cunningham, second by Councillor Kinney. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried. And then I'm guessing this is the development permit then. Do you want to speak to that then? Uh, I yeah? Okay. Absolutely. It. So this is the artist rendering. Uh, Microphone, sorry. I apologize. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so this is the ar artist rendering of the of the proposed project. Um, the materials um, and the color schemes are going to be sort of a, uh, according to this to this drawing. Uh, this development permit um, uh, satisfies all the, all of the multifamily all of the multifamily uh, design guidelines and. Um, the costs are covered by the application fee, and the proposed project complies with the multifamily design guidelines. Therefore, the recommendation. Okay, so recommendation that's subject to development. Oh, we already did that. Council issued development permit number 1711. Moved by Councillor Ken Aranish, second by Councillor Renhala. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Looking forward to seeing this development. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Okay, moving on for our report from our communications manager regarding approval of a communications apology for the City of Prince Rupert. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm here to do today to bring forward the recommendation that Council repeal the previous 2003 communications policy and approve by resolution the attached communications policy. Um, as you all know, uh, Councillor Moreau brought forward some recommendations regarding um, incorporating best practices on closed meetings into a communications policy. And so uh, we also took that opportunity to kind of flesh out the existing communications policy and have it reflect more of the modern technology that's available as well as staff resources. So that's all I'll really say about that unless you have any questions. Um, the only costs really to the recommendation are costs of staff time. Okay, questions from Council? Council Murrow? Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thanks very much for, for all your hard work on this policy. It's much appreciated. Um, I think you've definitely captured the the spirit of, of my original motion, so I'm, I'm glad to see that. I have just a, a quick question about, this is more um, kind of a process question. There was one piece about um, corporate social media, and uh, I think it, it basically had to do with um, any department that wants to start their own social media account needs Authorization, and I was wondering, from your perspective, why wouldn't the city want to centralize all communications from one portal? Just have the one city of Prince Rupert social media portal, um, rather than having each separate department have their own. 
part of that was to incorporate the way that things are already kind of coordinated through recreation. So because recreation is in a separate building, they currently have a staff person who manages their social media pages. And so I just wanted to help allow that to continue because I think that they're doing a great job there and it's it's easier than having them go through me and, and they've been very qualified and they follow all of the kind of um, content guidelines that we've provided. So unless council would like to change that, which is an option too. That was exactly what I was thinking about was you have recreation specific uh, communications and programs and free swims and mm -hmm. I am also an administrator on that page as well as Prince Rupert Economic Development and love Prince Rupert so and Cowboy Marina which are all the pages that we have if you'd like to follow us um, so, so I am involved in those as well but uh, yeah I just wanted to give staff some ability to continue to maintain that um, independence Oh, oh, yeah, follow up. Absolutely. Sorry, yeah, I just had one more one more question. So, um, in the piece about um, in in camera disclosure, I think kind of the the spirit that we were trying to achieve was proactive disclosure, which is basically not not undermining the original reason to go in camera, but trying to disclose what we can when we can, as as best we can. Um, I'm just wondering, kind of the discussions that staff were having in terms of how to find that balance with. Um, of, of kind of providing disclosure on on the individual reasons for going in camera, how can how can we balance providing more of a detailed description of why we're going in camera without actually undermining ourselves for the reason for going in camera? Does that does that make sense? How, how did how, I think you've done a good job striking that balance? But I'm just kind of wondering some of the rationale for for the the final recommendations you made. So generally, we're going in camera to discuss land, uh, legal, and labor. So that's kind of the big three that we're going into camera to discuss. So uh, generally, if we can, the, the idea was to provide as much information about which specific item that would be. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. but I, I'm just wondering, is, is, there, is there any mechanism for us um, in those particular in-camera meetings where we have to deal with land and labor instead of just land or just labor, is there a way for us to provide a little bit more of a description of why we're going in-camera without actually undermining the reason? Yeah. I think that that's possible. I think I will have to flesh out a little bit more specifically what that would look like with corporate administration and l with the legal team just to be a bit more comfortable around that just because we are kind of riding that line of making sure that we're abiding by privacy legislation as well as being accountable to the public. So that yeah, might be a bigger discussion to have. <laughs> that's good. Uh, I haven't had a chance to thoroughly read this yet. And it's a pretty important document. And there's pieces in here that uh, I've just breezed over. And I would like to have a little more time to look at this. So if it's okay with council, I'd like to table this to the next meeting so we can take a better look at it. You're seconding that? Okay. Okay, so... Uh, Mr. Maddock, just remind me, uh, there's no discussion on tabling, right? Okay, so all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. So this is tabled to the next meeting then. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering um, before the, uh, at the next meeting if we could, I was just, I had some questions that I was wondering if we could get answers back by the, for the next meeting, if that's... Uh, yeah, I was hoping to actually have a bit of a discussion, but... Uh, um, oh. Why don't, uh, These aren't questions because I know we can't really discuss it, but I had some, I had some, just some questions that I will ask next time, sure. and then you'll have to wait for another. Or could you, could two you email weeks. the questions? Sure. Okay. Let's, if there's questions from council, let's just email them. But uh, yeah. Okay, we'll just we'll discuss it. Do we email them to Veronica or to you or uh, to, to Veronica? Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, geez, didn't get a chance to chat, unfortunately. Okay, next meeting. Moving on, uh, 9A, um, so we're just finalizing from last meeting, so recommendation that Council adopts the 2017 five-year financial amendment bylaw number 3418 to 2017, moved by Councillor Kenny, second by Councillor Nish. All those in favour, any opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, reports from Council. Okay, motion to adjourn. No, 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 no. Oh. <laughs> what a surprise. Hey, it was brought to my attention today 
down at the uh, corner by uh, BC Packers, Ocean Fish, whatever you want to call it, the cro- kitty corner to it, West Coast Marine Response, had uh, they've been parking partially on city property, like hundreds of other people in this town do. They put down, laid down some gravel in that because it was turning into a bit of a mud hole. And today the city went down there and put cement blocks so they couldn't park there. Now, I can see one or two blocks are fine, but the others, I, I can't understand why they're there. They, uh, you know, somebody said about, oh, the city can't get and cut up, cut the grass going up to the, uh, the, uh, pump house there well the city can always get through there but uh, it's just you know we have enough of a parking problem in this town already and to take more parking places away from a business that pays substantial taxes also is just you know I I don't think it it was looked into properly and I, I think we should be trying to work with people to create more parking not take parking away and and the fact that this this person, this property owner, went and spent three thousand dollars of their own money to smooth it out and improve it. And then, I don't know what those blocks cost the city, but uh, if it was that much of a concern, if we could have put those curve blocks in there or something like that. They've got these bloody big blocks in there, and it, to me, it's just two people sitting down and working something out, not just saying no, you can't do that and blang, because it's creating a problem for parking down there again. And uh, I, I just think that I'd, I'd like it looked into a little more and find out exactly what the reason was. It just seems to be uh, two heads budding together. Thank you, Your Worship. I can speak to it. Um, West Coast Marine Response uh, went ahead without any uh, city permission, without any permitting, and brought a mini excavator onto city property and uh, excavated material there, scraped off the top, put gravel down. Uh, we have a force main that's right underneath uh, that parking area that is quite fragile, plus we have uh, gravity lines under there. We have a pump house that's right up beside. Um, we are looking uh, on our plan for um, in the spring, we're putting a sidewalk uh, on that side. Uh, there's a crosswalk that crosses Dry Dock Road that goes right to that corner uh, to go to the new um, Rushbrook Trail that's being completed now. So there is a, a currently a crosswalk there, and we were going to put an asphalt sidewalk with uh, with um, then paint after that to get pedestrians safely across. So we we had to um, sort of react to what was done there uh, and protect our infrastructure. So long story short is they should have came to us first? <laughs> exactly. Right. Okay, first of all, the sidewalk you're going to put in, there's a telephone pole sitting there, it's going to be on the other side of that. And your fragile drain now has one of those big cement blocks sitting on top of it. <laughs> you know, I don't think this is a time to argue with operations. Right. Their job is to manage these things. I think they did what they were supposed to do there. That's uh, part of our reasoning. Anyway, any other reports from Council? Okay, motion to adjourn. Moved by Council Morrow, second by Council Randhawa. All those in favor? Meetings adjourned. <laughs>